Hi everybody, welcome to Counseling Class Online. We're just going to make the best of this. And the place we're going to start is essentially by leaving, picking up where we left off last week. I know we had talked about the intake session, we'd gone through all this information, and then we moved on to things to do in the intake session. And finally, at least in terms of these stages, we are at the termination stage. So we're going to talk about term, different types of terminations here today. And really, there are three different kinds of terminations that we work with within counseling. The first one is terminating a unit of discussion. So this is when we have different kinds of techniques to end a topic. So you've been discussing a various topic, particular topic with a client, and it's time to move on uh, because either you've reached a natural ending or maybe you're headed down a road that you don't see as very fruitful. So how do you do that? One thing you can do is make a summary statement. So you could say something to the client like, uh, well, it seems like we have a better or you have a better understanding of the motivations that your mom is giving for her behaving like this. So why don't we move on to talking about other family members? That would be an example of summarizing a unit of discussion. Or you can make a direct topic change, which I sometimes will do with clients, especially if they're talking about other people. I know I've talked quite a bit about how clients will sometimes say, my mom did this, and my dad did this, and my boyfriend did this, but we really want them to talk about themselves and their own feelings. So I might actually say to the client, you know, I have, I think I have, have a pretty good understanding of the things that your mom did to you. Let's talk about how that uh, how, how you respond to that, what the effects of that are on you. So that's basically saying to the client, let's make a shift. Or you can make a more subtle shift, which is kind of a, a middle of the road um, sort of way and really combining the previous two. So unit of, term, unit of discussion is one type of termination we do. We also do interview terminations. And this one's a really interesting one because in most places, you get maybe 50 minutes with a client, maybe a little longer, maybe shorter, depending on the situation. So ending the interview is sometimes a difficult thing. Uh, clients will want to keep talking, that sort of thing. So there are a couple of things that you can do um, to help terminate the interview. The first thing to do is to set the time restraints to the client at the beginning. You don't have to do this every session, but usually the first couple sessions with a client I'll say something like, well we've got 50 minutes today, or we've got 30 minutes or whatever, so how do you think it would be most helpful to use our time? So they know from the outset how much time they're going to get. And then as you get toward the end, it's a good idea to try and sum things up um, make some kind of a summary statement. Well, it, you could say something like, you know, this was a really good session. I think you got a, re a much better understanding of why your mother behaves the way she does and how it affects you. And then if clients keep talking, which sometimes will happen, sometimes you have to be really obvious. And, and you might think, well, why can't you go over for a few minutes? Well, the problem is if you're in a typical kind of place and you go over by a few minutes, it's gonna make you go over every session. We're just like doctors. If somebody runs late, everybody's gonna run late. But then the other thing is it's really a boundary issue. You know, if clients see that they can get you to take more time with them, they'll generally keep trying to do that. And we're trying to model appropriate boundaries for them. So what I, I usually do to be real obvious about it is toward the end of the session, I'll do my summary statements, start trying to wrap up. And if the client isn't really getting the hint or doing that, if they're still talking, usually what I'll do is pick up their folder from on my desk and open it up and, and kind of scratch some things. And I'll get my appointment book out and open it and kind of look at them. And those are nonverbal signals that it's time to wrap it up. And usually that does it pretty well. But sometimes I have to interrupt people. Now, a couple things about uh, terminating the interview, you really do want to avoid leaving the client in an extreme emotional state. So if your client is sobbing or incredibly angry, something like that, that's not the time to stand up and say, oh, time's up. So you can allow them a couple more minutes to calm down, but really it's, you know, you, you just have to do the best you can. And one of the things I explained to clients at the beginning is you might not leave every session feeling really great. You know, our job is not to wrap up everything in a night and tie it with a nice bow and send them out the door. So it's okay for them to leave a little upset, but you definitely want to avoid an extreme state. So what you can do if that's the case is 
first of all, avoid uh, tricky subjects as, as you're getting closer to the end. So if you know talking about their dad is just a really hard for, thing for them and is always upsetting, I would steer clear of that topic as you get toward the last 10, 15 minutes or so. You could, if it happens sporadically and not too often, allow them more time, a couple more minutes to pull themselves together. But if you find that pretty much every session they're doing this toward the end, that's something that merits a confrontation. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. That's a form of resistance. They're um, not wanting to let you go. They're wanting more time with you. So that's probably something you need to have a discussion with them about. Okay, the last type of termination is termination of the actual relationship you have with the client. Now, I know I mentioned in class the other day for you to think about an example of a relationship with a, a voluntary relationship or a friend or, or a, um, someone close to you that you've actually ended voluntarily in a positive way and everybody feels positive about it. It really doesn't happen in real life very often, but in a counseling kind of relationship we really want to try and make that happen so what we do in this session and usually the last session is we prepare the client and we help set future goals for them so termination isn't something that's done suddenly so you don't reach the end of a session and say to a client oh well I th you know i think you've come far enough and i don't think you need to see me anymore good terminations are done with several sessions in advance. So let's say that their insurance pays for six to eight sessions. They know that from the outset. And if you see that that's really going to be enough for them at this point, probably I would say if you go eight sessions, that fifth session, you start talking about it, you know, and you say, well, we've done this kind of work. I think just a few more sessions, you're really going to be in a good place. So that by the time you get to that last session, the client is well prepared for it to happen. So the ideal reason for termination is because the client met their goals. It's a mutually agreed upon between you and the client. They met their goals. So it's something that you've prepared them for. You, at the end, summarize what you've worked on, uh, set future goals for them. And the way I like to think about it, if you look at this picture here, counseling is really like practicing a skill with a net under you. So you're walking on the high wire and you, the counselor, are the net. So they're practicing new skills skills, learning new things, new coping strategies. And then when they leave you, they know how to walk on that net pretty well, or they walk on that wire pretty well, and they don't need the net anymore. You, the net, are as taken, taken away. So sometimes I'll share that metaphor with clients, and they really like it for the most part. Now, sometimes we clients, uh, we terminate with clients for different reasons. I know I've mentioned this before. Um, Sometimes they just disappear. They just stop coming. Rarely do they let you know they're not going to come anymore. Most of the time they just either will cancel an appointment they have with you or just won't reschedule and you won't realize it. And you rarely get an answer. And you, I think you kind of learn to stop taking that personally because you have no idea what it's about. It may have absolutely nothing to do with you. It may be, who knows, it just may be because they found some other resource in their life or, you know, maybe they started seeing their pastor for counseling. Who knows? But um, most of the time, the agency that you work for, if that's the case, they'll send the client a letter stating the reasons why perhaps uh, the hope was that they would continue in counseling, still had goals to work for. But sometimes you really just have to let them go. So sometimes the client terminates prematurely, or sometimes you have to terminate if you just can't work with that client. If there's a serious personality clash, or maybe it's a lack of expertise. Maybe they're presenting a problem that's just outside of what you can do. Um, sometimes those are other kinds of goals. But the point is for the client to end counseling, feeling good about themselves, feeling good about counseling, and the progress that they've made. Now, sometimes a client will attempt to develop a social relationship with you after termination. And we've talked about romantic relationships, but what if a client says, hey, could we just, you know, I really enjoyed you. Can we just meet for coffee, you know, every few months or so? And the question is, is that okay? Think about what you think about that. It's technically not in the rules anywhere, although dual relationships are strongly cautioned against, of course. The overall thinking about that sort of thing is that it's not a good idea because you're always going to have that inequality going on. You will always have been in the position of helper and as one with more authority, and it's probably never going to be a real egalitarian relationship. So it's really, it's something to think about. So to sum up, 
terminations can really be a growth producing experience for your client. They learn that they can emerge from a relationship with their self-esteem strengthened and feeling good about themselves and the other person. Okay, so as a little pause to move on to the next topic here, I have this silly cartoon. So the guy's going, people avoid me. And obviously even the therapist is avoiding this guy. All right, so the last section of this chapter that we're going to talk about are techniques. And we've already talked about a couple of techniques, but I want to go into some detail on some other ones. So the place I want to start is by just having you all, and we would discuss this if we were in class, think about a problem that you've had in the past that you have been unable to fix yourself, or a fear that you've had that you've been unable to talk yourself out of. So maybe let's take test anxiety. That's a common thing for people. So maybe you've studied really hard for the exam, you know the material, and as you're walking in, you're just so nervous, and you're telling yourself, don't be scared, I know this material, but you still feel scared. Or, um, I mean, it really could be anything. You're flying in a plane, and you're scared, and you're telling yourself, I know planes just, you know, they're very safe, they're safer than driving, don't worry, but you're unable to take care of that fear. So think about something like that. We all have problems and issues that we can't seem to fix ourselves. So our, what happens is that our attempts to control our behavior and our feelings on our own fail. And we try by rational argument, by persuading ourselves, by telling ourselves to change, by analyzing things, and we still fail. So I take sometimes, for example, my problem with returning phone calls. I hate talking on the phone. So when I get a phone call and a message, it takes me forever to respond. And I know it's because I don't like talking on the phone, but even if it's a short call, it's still takes me forever. So my analysis and my attempts to rehabilitate myself have just failed miserably. So people may know intellectually what they should do, but they still can't feel or act accordingly. So think about the times you've said to yourself, oh, don't be afraid. Everything's going to be okay. So maybe you're going into a new situation where you don't really know anybody. Don't be scared, but you still feel scared. Or somebody says to you or you say to yourself, oh, don't let that bother you. So maybe somebody doesn't return a text message to you and you feel blown off and, and you're thinking, oh, don't worry about it. But you still worry about it. It still bothers you. Or the best one and the worst one, my mom used to say this to me all the time, oh, just think positive when I'd be worried about something. That absolutely doesn't work. It never works. And we're going to talk really about why that never works or hardly ever works. The reason these kind of attempts never work uh, is because these are all cognitive attempts to change our behavior and they're not going to work. It's because we're not really tapping the real cause of the problem or the real cause of our fear. So if we could control our behaviors and our feelings through conscious rational means, we wouldn't need therapists. We wouldn't need therapists because we'd be able to do everything we needed to do and not ever feel worried or depressed about it. For example, when you're feeling bummed out about something, you can't really persuade yourself not to feel depressed. If you feel depressed, you feel depressed. So this is what we call the access problem. And the access problem is the reason why we need therapists and why they're helpful to us. What this means is when we have an issue or a problem, we do not have access to the entire problem. We don't have access to what's really causing the problem. So one part of you can know what you need to do to change, but that knowledge doesn't affect other parts of you. So let me give you a couple of examples. And I absolutely love this picture of Freud here. He just looks like a lunatic. So in terms of psychoanalysis, uh, according to psychoanalysis, the cause of our problems are unconscious. Well, if they're unconscious, we're not aware of them. We can't access them. So maybe you have just this strange fear that you can't figure out. Well, the psychoanalyst would say it's because the reason is unconscious. And so you can't solve it on your own because we can't access our unconscious easily on our own. Or a cognitive therapist would say, if we have problems, particularly fears, it's because of these underlying irrational beliefs that we have. So for example, test anxiety is very commonly caused by an irrational belief that you have to do really well on every test. And if you ask somebody with test anxiety, is that why you're feeling anxious? They may not be able to tell you that because irrational beliefs tend to be buried to some extent. 
And then the client-centered therapists say that, well, the reason we have problems is because our real self is hidden. So let's take uh, somebody who's in a relationship and they're, they're really unhappy in that relationship and they can't figure out why because this person seems to be really great and you know how we say they look really good on paper, but you can't figure out why you're ha unhappy, why you're not satisfied. Well, it's probably because there's some part of you that isn't able to be yourself in this relationship. You're not able to be expressed. You can't grow in this relationship for some reason. And that also tends to be hidden. So what this all means is that behavior is at least partially created by a lack of awareness. It doesn't matter whether you're a Freudian or not. No matter what theory you hold, there's always something about our behavior that's caused by something just out of our reach. Every theoretical perspective or every counseling perspective assumes that pathological behavior or problem behavior is at least partially created by a lack of awareness. Lack of awareness. So we are partially controlled by factors that lie outside of our conscious awareness. We cannot control this lack of awareness. So a good example is, let's say you're in a relationship that's not good for you. Now I'm not talking about an abusive relationship, but one that you're just, you just know isn't the right thing, but you can't somehow seem to end it. You keep hanging on and you can't figure out why you can't end it because you know it's probably not a good one. Well, the aware self of you knows, okay, this isn't good for me. I could find somebody better and somebody who works better for me. But you can't understand why you can't break away. Well, the part of you that's not aware doesn't know, and we'll take a Freudian stance here, that what you're doing is really picking partners who, again, look good on paper and would please perhaps your parents, your father. So everybody you pick is somebody that you think your father would approve of, somebody who just looks really good on the outside, and you have this really strong underlying need to please your father. So that part you're not aware of, and you need some help to, uh, to figure that out. And that's really where counseling will come in. So let's move to talking about some of the specific techniques that we use in counseling, and at least one of them we've already talked about. The techniques we're going to talk about are ones that are used by every counselor. It doesn't matter your theoretical orientation. Um, these are techniques that are common to all all counselors. And when we talk here in a week or so about individual perspectives like psychoanalysis and humanistic, we'll talk about techniques specific to those particular perspectives. So the one we'll start off with is one of the most commonly used ones, and that is open-ended questions. So when we think about what an open-ended question is, it's a question that usually begins with who, what, where, when, how. Open-ended questions are going to facilitate conversation rather than stop conversation. So if a client is telling you about a relationship that just ended, you could say, oh, did that hurt you? But that's a closed-ended question because they're going to say, yeah, it did, or no, it didn't really. But if you ask, what was that like for you, then that's going to invite conversation and they're going to be able to express more with that kind of a sentence stem. So what I want to do, um, um, there's a video clip here, and I um, I don't know if I can, I don't think I can link to it in this YouTube video, but I'm going to place these slides, just the unrecorded version, on, um, on YouTube, and then, not on YouTube, excuse me, on Blackboard. I'm trying to think about too many things at the moment. I'm going to place them on Blackboard so you can go back and watch that. So this contains an example of open-ended questioning. But what I thought we'd do here is just work through our own example real quick. So I'm going to give you a couple of client statements, and I want you to think of one open-ended question you could ask in response. So say you have a client that says, I'm so tired of doing all the work in this relationship. So I want you to think for a minute about uh, go ahead and pause the tape and think what kind of a open-ended question would you ask and then a second one would be second example my problem is my wife and her constant complaints what would be your response to that so go ahead and pause the video and just jot down in your notes one open-ended question you could ask and then on the next slide I'll give you some examples Okay, so here are some possible examples of how you would um, 
you could answer that. So if, for instance, your client says, my problem is my wife and her constant complaints, you could say, well, what would need to happen for your wife to stop complaining? Or you could say, your wife is unhappy with some things. Well, how about you? Or if, uh, actually, I'm, I need to go back a little bit. The previous one, let me see if I can go back in the slides here. Okay, I had a little recording error there. Okay, so possible responses. If your client says, I'm so tired of doing all the work in this relationship, and you could say, could you give me some examples of what you mean by that? Or what kinds of reactions do you have when you see your partner putting in no effort? So these are some good open-ended questions that you could ask in response to the, those things that the client has said. All right, let's go ahead and move on to another technique, and it's one we've already talked about, and that is reflection of feeling. So the purpose of reflection of feeling, I'm going to breeze through this because we have spent some time on it, is to help the client recognize and express their own feelings and for you as the counselor to really demonstrate empathy. So this is really valuable for clients who, for example, have never allowed to be angry. Um, you, you can teach them that this is really an emotion that's allowed. And really the whole point of reflection of feeling is to help clients understand that you know what they're feeling and those emotions are okay. And it can really help a client deepen their feelings as we've talked about. So if a client says something like, I was so angry at her for cheating on me, your reflective response might be, you felt very betrayed by her. So this is a more complex empathic responses we talked about. You're actually going a little bit deeper than the emotion they have expressed and that's completely fine because that will continue conversation that invites more conversation. Now beginning counselors oftentimes get a little bit nervous with strong emotions. They feel insecure with clients feelings. You might feel and, and the habit is oftentimes to avoid them. You might feel like you are probing the client for further information. Um, you might feel like you're going to upset them and I don't want to say the purpose is to upset the clients but they come to us because that's what, what we do is help them discover their feelings and help deal with that. So it's just something to remember and I think as you get more experience you get much better at that. So that's enough of that. We've spent lots of time on reflection of feeling. Okay, what about a technique of silence? Now this is something that people probably are surprised to hear that this is a technique. Silence and counseling is scary. It makes counselors uncomfortable. It makes you sometimes babble and feel like you're saying anything because, I mean, silence in our, our, um, our everyday relationships tends to be really uncomfortable. So especially so in counseling because you're supposed to be the one who knows what to say. So counselors sometimes will babble on or say anything. But it's important to know that you as the counselor, it is not your responsibility to keep the client talking. I mean, yes, you need to ask questions and show your empathy, but it's they're the ones that are coming for the healing and they need to keep doing the talking. So silences tend to be overlooked as far as how important they are. They can be very therapeutic, often very therapeutic because it allows clients to absorb insights, either something you've said or something that they have said and they just need to think about. So let's talk about different kinds of silence you might encounter in sessions. First of all, what we call the counselor induced silence. So that means that it's the counselor's turn to speak and you're not saying anything. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, it might be because of under participation. So maybe you are unsure or insecure of where to go with the client. You really don't know what to say. Um, maybe you weren't really listening. Maybe you were daydreaming a little bit. So, you know, if you take a little snooze or so, um, you may just let silences go because you don't, you're a little bit lost in the conversation. Sometimes as counselors, we don't know what to say. We really are at a loss for words. You don't always have to know what to say. It's okay if you don't know what to say. Sometimes the kinds of heavy things, serious things, sad things, hard things that clients tell us, we don't really have a good response for, and that's completely okay. And it's okay to say to a client, 
wow, I'm just really at a loss for words. They're not going to judge you negatively for that unless you're saying it all the time. So you don't always have to know what to say. And then sometimes it's deliberate. Sometimes it might be our turn to speak, but we don't say anything because we want the client to think about what they've just said or what we have just said. So we don't want to interfere with the client's momentum. But then there's also client-induced silences that occur too. So sometimes uh, the client, it, it may be opening new doors to their awareness, and that's really the ideal kinds of things. But sometimes the client may be under-participating, um, they might be shirking their responsibility, and these are oftentimes clients that see your job as to take care of them, to treat them, to tell them what to do, and at that point it merits a confrontation, which will... Um, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. So generally the guiding rule on how silences work is that the person who begins the silence breaks it. So if it's the client, so let's say the client has finished speaking and it's my turn to speak, but I allow the silence to go through, then I can pick it up when I feel like it's been long enough or if there's something else to say. So that's just kind of the general rule for silence. So it's important to think about them as a really useful therapeutic tool. A couple more very commonly used techniques by all counselors and the next one we'll talk about is called reframing. So reframing is, another way to think about reframing is that it's relabeling. We take usually a negative thought or a feeling that a client has and we relabel it in a healthier way. So one way of thinking about it is if a client says something like they really feel taken advantage of, um, they feel like they're too giving, you could perhaps reframe that as, you know, you're really, you're a, you're a loving, you're a compassionate, you're a very giving person. So it's reframing it in a more positive, healthier way. Or if a client uh, is very introverted and they, they say, oh, you know what, I'm just, I'm so shy and awkward and I'm really passive and let people walk all over me, you could perhaps reframe that as you know you're really just a very thoughtful introspective person who's very concerned about the needs of others so it's just a way of, of um, a more constructive way it's an alternative perception of reality is one way of thinking about it so the reason I have this dollar bill here is there's this great demonstration that I would of course do if I were there with you but I'll describe it to you so what I would do is ask any of you in class if you had a dollar bill and uh, so somebody will have one or they might give me a 20 which is even more entertaining and so what I do is hold up the dollar bill and I say how much is this worth and you all will say it's worth a dollar and then what I'll do is wad it up into crumple it up into a little ball I'll throw it on the floor and stomp on it and scrape it with my shoe a couple times and then I'll pick it up and hold up this yucky dirty mess in front of you and say now how much is this worth and you'll say a dollar and the point I will make here is that sometimes I'll use this with clients who have been hurt or abused or otherwise mistreated and I'll say you know the way that somebody treats you does not determine your value or your worth in anyway and clients really appreciate that visual kinds of techniques like that make a big impact but it's also a way of reframing it's a way of reframing what what your worth is uh, all about and, and uh, it really helps clients feel better okay once in a while we will give something that's called a directive now you know that counseling isn't about giving advice and we don't give clients advice but sometimes we do help steer them towards actions without telling them what to do for the most part so with a directive we try to get the client to take a certain action so maybe a client is trying to make a decision uh, they're in a relationship should they stay or should they go well, we're not going to tell them what to do but we can give them directives that will help them make that decision so directives could be, first of all, approval of an action or a feeling or an observation, for example. For instance, if a client decided to have a talk with somebody they're in a relationship with and they were really honest about their feelings and it was just a, a good discussion that they initiated, you can approve of that. You can say, I think that was a really great idea and you helped uh, get your feelings out there and and clear the air so that's one way to take a directive approve or you can try and get the client to do something for example one of the homework assignments that we very typically give clients who are either um, uh, 
a grieving a relationship or have some have some unfinished baggage maybe there's something they needed to say to somebody they're no longer in a relationship with we will have them write an unsent letter so we'll have them write a letter to that person telling them what their true feelings are but they don't send it and usually we'll have them bring that into session with us and we will uh, we may or may not read it but we'll discuss it with them and that really helps clients understand what it is they're feeling without the threat of having to actually have a conversation with somebody so that's a directive if we ask them to do that another thing that we very commonly do is ask clients to perform a cost benefit analysis now what this is it's like a pros and cons list this is from economics so again if a client's trying to make a decision about something let's say they're trying to decide should I uh, get a job after graduation and work a year or should I go straight into graduate school now that's a question that uh, some of you had and I still absolutely intend to review the to uh, revive these professional tips and as soon as things calm down here a little bit um, I will do that but a cost-benefit analysis would be good for something like that so I would have the client make a list of what does getting a job straight out of college cost you um, how's it going to benefit you so an example of a cost might be you know I'm losing steam on school and I might decide I don't want to go back after I've been out of studying for a while but a benefit would be well I'm making up some money I'm storing up some money so that if I need to not work during graduate school I will have it so you'll have them do that cost benefit and then you'll have them bring it in and you will discuss it with them so that would be another example of taking a directive Okay, two more. Interpretations. Um, we do interpretations. They're probably one of the lesser used techniques because most of the techniques we used are, use are about inviting more conversation, exploring feelings. But interpretations can help to provide clients with a new way to view a situation. Um, it, it can point to underlying causes of behavior specifically so if you have an idea of what might be causing a client's behavior you can go ahead and offer it to them as a hypothesis you know you don't know for sure but if you offer a hypothesis it might give them a new way to think about something so there's a couple different times that we might use interpretations first of all it helps to point out themes or patterns in a client's behavior so say you've got a client who complains that nobody likes them they don't have any close relationships and you know through talking to them that whenever they get close to somebody they they tend to idolize them and then they reject them if they do the least little thing to them you see that pattern so you can point that pattern out to clients and it can help them understand why they're doing what they're doing and perhaps change their behavior interpretations can also be used to interpret clients defenses and resistance um, I think I mentioned the example to you before maybe not in this way I, I had a client years ago who was dealing with some bulimic behaviors and every session she would come in she would talk really pot no I didn't tell you this yet she would talk really positively about all the great things uh, you know I, I didn't um, I didn't purge this week I didn't binge this week I'm, I'm working really hard on being honest with people every session was like positive things and she never talked about the struggles she had so one time she came in and I said you know it seems like everything's going so well for you and I've noticed you do look like you've gained a couple of pounds as you needed to congratulations she went pale I mean she literally turned white as a ghost um, finished out the session and then she never came back so <laughs> that was my mistake I was more of a rookie counselor but clearly that interpretation was a little bit too much for her her defense was that she would come in and just tell me all the positive things that had happened without really working on the negative things which was the reason for her bulimia so sometimes you can go too far with these interpretations and then we can also use interpretations to relate past things to present kinds of things so we tend to we tend to repeat old patterns of behaving and feeling because it's very comfortable for us so let's say you've got a client a woman who's used to being the peacemaker in her home 
And in her relationship, she's always the, the giving one. She's always the one to give in. But then she gets stepped on in relationships and she can't keep relationships together. So you could point out that this old way of behaving that may have worked for her in her family of origin is no longer working for her. So that's very helpful, can be very helpful. Okay, the final technique that we will talk about is confrontation. And this one, I think, is really misunderstood by people. Because when we think about confrontations in our own lives, they're not pleasant. Sometimes they're negative. Sometimes they're angry or hostile. Confrontations and counseling are not meant to be like that. So what confrontations do is allow clients to face something that they want to avoid. It really puts it right out there so that they have to deal with it. That's the way to think about it. So here are some reasons that we would use confrontation. First of all, if there is a discrepancy between what the clients say and how they behave. So their verbal behavior and then their overt behavior. So if I have a client who comes in and uh, has been considering getting out of a relationship, they're in a relationship they really want to get out of and they're not happy about it, but then one day they come in and I've had this happen before and say that they're thinking about having a child with the person that they're in a relationship with. Well, that merits a confrontation because what you're saying you want to get out of it is very different than how you're behaving, moving towards having a child. So that would merit a confrontation. We would use a confrontation if there's a discrepancy between what the clients say and what their nonverbals say. So uh, this is where it's helpful to look at body language of clients. Sometimes they laugh. Clients will tend to laugh a lot when they're talking about negative things or painful things. So when there's that discrepancy, you would confront. You might say something like, you know, you're telling me you're comfortable talking about this, but yet you are, you won't look at me and you can't look at me and you seem really anxious. So if they, their nonverbals are telling you something different than what they're saying, then that would merit a confrontation. And then finally, if there's a discrepancy between two verbal messages, that would merit a discrepancy. So let's say you have a client who is talking about how they just, they're working some job they're not interested in, they need to get their stuff together, go back to school, but yet at the same time, they're blaming for pay their parents for not helping them out financially. So on the one hand, they're talking about how they have to take responsibility from themselves for themselves, and on the other hand, they are blaming their parents for not helping them. So that would be uh, merit confrontation. Now, let's talk about what confrontations are not. They are not <laughs> angry, they're not hostile, they're not accusing, they are not lecturing, they're not judging, they're not labeling. They're not the things that we've been led to believe confrontations really are. Uh, and as part of the labeling, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to say things to people like that's, oh, that's OCD behavior, that's codependent behavior, anything like that. So here are some of the things that, that confrontation should accomplish. First of all, it should set you up as a role model for direct communication. We need to be able to do good confrontations in our lives. Even if we don't call it that, um, you know, you're real, really role modeling direct communication, and that's what you need to do. We are providing action-oriented stimulus for a client. In other words, we are getting them to take action. Clients often avoid facing their problematic behavior. So this puts it right out there and asks them to do something about it. And then it also helps provide congruence between their behavior, their thoughts, their feelings. So the three ways, the three examples of when you would use a confrontation, it helps align those things so that they're behaving the way that they're thinking and they're saying things that are really congruent with uh, the way they're behaving. So that's important. Timing is important. You don't want to do confrontations early on in your counseling relationship with the client or you will probably lose them. It's best to do them after you've had a few sessions in your under your belt and they trust you. Um, on the the unrecorded PowerPoint that I'm going to put on Blackboard, here is a brief. I couldn't find a great video on confrontation, uh, one that I was really satisfied with. This one this one is kind of a gentle confrontation in a counseling session. It's a it's a mock up. It's a you know a, a role play kind of thing, but it's worth taking a look at to see how confrontations would go. 
Okay, that's the end of the material for this chapter. This also ends the material that we're going to have for the exam. So if anyone has any questions, just shoot me an email.